Human rights. Ah, it's been a beautiful week of uh, spring vacation as I record this, unseasonably warm and wonderful time to think about horrible, horrible things like uh, tortures and arbitrary killings and the human rights that arguably are there to defend us against them. So let's dig into it. <clears throat> Few big issues about human rights. The first one, sort of the deepest one, certainly the biggest one for policymakers, is the question of what human rights there are. We're going to get into the question of whether there are any, but um, it's widely accepted discourse. If you talk about human rights, people will know what you're talking about, but there will be many arguments about what specifically is on the list, what counts as a human right. Very closely related to this is the question of who decides um, whose list should be determinant, and determining of what is something we're going to get into. Uh, and one of the big issues that comes up here is the question of whether or not, uh, skipping down on the PowerPoint a little bit, whether or not human rights are inherently a Western concept, or a bourgeois concept, or a modern concept, or whether they have some sort of broader cultural universality, whether they're bound to one particular culture or whether they are something that transcends culture and that everyone at least ought to agree to. Another question as you're building the list of human rights is whether when we talk about human rights, we're talking about some subset of morality that deals with just the bare minimum of things for decent human life, or whether under human rights we have in mind a more comprehensive political morality. So this kind of issue is basically whether or not you think when we say human rights we should restrict ourselves just to extremely egregious abuses, like say genocide or whether we want to talk more comprehensively about what makes a good human life. Um, do we want to include things like rights to pursue fulfillment, right? the American right to the pursuit of happiness? <clears throat> or if someone is prevented from pursuing a fulfilling life, is that unfortunate and bad but not a matter of human rights? And finally, uh, and what threads a lot of these things together from a policy perspective, is the question of whether human rights should be given political, legal, or especially coercive force. One of the things that's characteristic of human rights as a concept is actually that it's a concept that straddles the line between morality and law. It's often a little bit ambiguous what people are talking about when they talk about human rights, whether they have in mind a purely moral concept, whether we're just talking about what ought to be done in sort of the broad moral sense, or whether we're talking about what ought to be enshrined in law. And those two things may come apart. There may be good laws that don't track morality, and there may be moral things that shouldn't be in the law. All right, so that's what we're going to explore for the next little while. So what are they, structurally? Um, <clears throat> this is just a matter of figuring out what we're talking about to keep at least conceptually, human rights from just collapsing trivially into all of morality. Even if you have a fairly comprehensive picture of human rights, that should be interesting, not just because, oh, when I say human rights, I just mean what's good and good and good and evil. Um, so, let me fiddle with my volume here. Ah. So, there's a few structural things to keep in mind about the concept of a right and the concept of a human right. <coughs> Pardon me, I will stop coughing at some point during this recording. The first thing, and this is something that really comes down from one of the great philosophers of law, Felon van Hofeld, is just to get a, a grip on what a right is, period. It's easy to make it sound like when we talk about rights, we're just describing some kind of metaphysical status to someone. Um, Jeremy Bentham famously called the idea of natural rights nonsense on stilts. Uh, and the issue is that 
if we want to get a grip on what a right is, it makes it very mysterious if we just think of it as something that an individual has. You know, what does it mean to have a right? And what Hofeld argues, and uh, the version that is dominant in both moral and legal consideration of rights, is that to make sense of a right, you need to understand it as having a correlative duty or obligation attached to it. So when you say that I have a right to something, what you're really saying is just as much that someone else in the world, at least one other person in the world, has some kind of obligation towards me. This might be in the case of a sort of negative rights, what are often called negative rights, that there are prohibitions. If I have a right to a right against torture, then what this means is that other people have an obligation not to torture me, an obligation to refrain from torturing me. That's what it means for me to have the right, is that everyone else has that obligation. And in the case of negative rights, it usually is everyone else. Um, I have a right not to be tortured. Nobody can torture me. Every single person on the planet should not be torturing me. On the other hand, there are some rights that are sometimes termed positive rights, that the obligations... Um, Positive rights are, are rights to something. And so the generally speaking, the obligation is that someone do something, not just that they refrain from doing something. So if I have a right to food, for instance, this implies on the general understanding, at least on the most straightforward understanding, this implies that someone out there in the world if I am not able to obtain food on my own for some reason, that someone out there in the world has an obligation to see to it that I get food. Give me food, give me money for food, teach me how to fish, something like that. Now, the positive rights, and this is something that people have often been concerned about, the positive rights often raise harder questions about who exactly has the obligation. So one way to understand a right to food would be to say, well, if I don't have food, um, then everybody should give me food. But of course, that that can't quite be right, right? We don't think that everyone should simultaneously give me food. If we say that, we mean something more like whoever's best able to give me food, maybe whoever comes across me starving first should give me food, um, something like that. And in policy terms, really the default, not for everyone, but the most common way of understanding positive rights is that the obligation applies to the state, um, whoever, whoever is, uh, whoever, whatever state has jurisdiction over you ought to supply that. That's not morally necessary or philosophically necessary. That's just realistically the way that these things are often understood. Um, generally speaking, if we say we have a right to food, we mean something like if you can't provide food for yourself, your government should help you get food. Okay, so that's just to say what a right is. A right is some status that you have that generates obligations for at least some other people in the world, and in many cases generates obligations for everyone else in the world with respect to you. So what does it mean to be a human right? There are all sorts of rights I might have. A human right is a right that I have merely in virtue of being human. Just being human is enough to get me that right. So this is an explicit contrast to two kinds of things. One is that it's not a right that I have because of some sort of special relationship, either chosen or unchosen. I'm an employee of the great state of Maryland. I have a right that Maryland give me money every two weeks so long as I keep up my teaching duties. I have a right that Maryland give me money. That right arises from my contract. If I didn't have that contract, I wouldn't have the right. So that's a contractual right. My daughter has a right that I give her food every day. You know, I cook her dinner, I make sure she's got lunch packed for school. She has a right that I do that. Um, not everyone in the world has a right that I do that. Even other people, if I have a right to make see, see that they get fed, not everyone in the world has a right that I, you know, make them dinner every night. That right that she has arises from a special unchosen, at least unchosen on her side, relationship with me. So human rights don't have anything to do with special relationships that you might have with other people or with institutions. 
they also specifically don't have to do with achievements, right? If you write really good memos for this class, you have a right to an A or an A minus at least. That has to do with your achievement. You've accomplished something and you have a right to recognition of that accomplishment. Human rights are understood to not require accomplishment. You could be a lonesome person with no relationships, who signed no contracts, who is completely useless and has accomplished nothing in his or her life, and you would still have human rights. <coughs> That's the concept. Just being alive and being human is enough. And part of the reason for insisting on this for the human rights defenders has been that has been the view that too often in history people have been denied basic rights on grounds that don't seem justified and they've been denied things that seem to be just part of being human just somehow tied to what is to be human and, and tied to ways that we should not treat other human beings so a lot of the baseline human rights like the right not to be tortured defenders of the concept want to say it doesn't it doesn't matter what you've done nobody should be tortured you don't have to earn the right not to be tortured um, this just flows in some way from the concept of human dignity or from the concept of what it is to be human among other humans okay the other part of, of human rights that makes them human rights is that they are generally taken by defenders of the concept to be universal they're not tied to any particular culture they're not tied to living in any particular state. Again, this is just a, a specific version of the all it takes is to be human. So even if your culture believes that torturing some kinds of people is okay, they're, they're wrong, say, say defenders of human rights. You can't do that. It doesn't matter what culture you're from. We're going to return to this issue about whether this is true. <coughs> Pardon me. But this is at least the claim of standard human rights theories. Okay, two more technical things. Human rights are generally understood as being inalienable. Uh, true human rights are things that nothing you can do can get rid of them. And in particular, there's two kinds of things um, that people who defend human rights typically worry about. One is, if you have a social contract theory of the state, then the understanding is that whatever the state can do, it does in some way because of your consent. You know, we went through before issues with the notion of consent here, but it's still a popular concept. So given that a lot of people who are concerned with human rights are specifically concerned with the ability to assert these rights against the state, Right? This is one of the main fora for human rights concerns. They, you don't want it to be the case that the state could claim, well, you know, yes, we're torturing this person, but uh, by being part of the state and by con living here and implicitly consenting to our laws that say if you, whatever, if you criticize the government, you can be tortured, um, he has given up his right not to be tortured. He's waived it. Human rights defenders want to say no doesn't work that way. And this is why, for instance, you'll often see on lists of human rights um, that are being careful, not things like a right to life, but things like a right against arbitrary deprivation of life or arbitrary depri deprivation of property. And the idea is that you don't have a right to keep all of your property, even if the state has passed duly democratically chosen laws about taxation, or even if the state has passed duly democratically chosen rules about capital punishment. There are some things, there are plenty of people who are human rights defenders who think that capital punishment is, is just completely out, but not necessarily. Um, on the other hand, there are some things like torture or rape that everybody has a right against no matter what. There's no such thing as, you know, well, arbitrary torture. It, no, that's not the only problem. It's any kind of torture. So the flip side of this, for a lot of people who are concerned with this and 
who want to emphasize the inalienability of it, is that the flip side of the you don't have to achieve anything to have a human right is that nothing you can do can deprive you of it. So most defenders of human rights would not want to say, even someone who defends, someone who's a defender of human rights who believes in capital punishment, for instance, would not want to say that if you commit certain crimes, you lose your right to life. No. You still have your right not to be arbitrarily deprived of life, and, the, and what they would point to is they say, look, if you have been legitimately condemned to death, for committing some crime. You still have your right to life because, for instance, we don't let just anyone bust in and kill you in the prison, right? If somebody broke into the prison trying to kill you, the guards would stop them. Uh, you know, we don't just say when you are condemned to death, all right, this person waives his right to life, anyone who wants to can kill him. No, it's only through the particular prescribed methods of, this, of, of the judicial system that it would even be considered allowable. Similar thing with property. Right? It's one thing to say the IRS is allowed to tax you and make you hand over some of your money in taxation. It's another thing to, or, or to say you're being fined for some violation. Right, Better than the IRS example. You've committed a crime and there's a $500 fine. Right, You pay that to the government. We don't just say, well, anyone's allowed to steal anything from this guy until he's had $500 worth of stuff stolen from him. So... The rights never go away no matter how heinous a thing you've done. And, you know, practically this comes out with folks who want to say that um, it's important to give even terrorists or genocidaires trials because everyone has a right to a day in court no matter how horrible the thing we think they've done is. Okay. Finally, and already alluded to a little bit, um, human rights are generally understood to trump other kinds of considerations. Uh, at least morally speaking. If there's a conflict between the right of a sovereign state to organize its affairs as it well pleases and human rights, well, the sovereign state doesn't have a right to violate its own citizens' rights. This comes into discussions about humanitarian intervention and that sort of thing, of course. Also, if human rights conflict with religion or tradition, so much the worse for religion and tradition. And in fact, this is one of the... This is one area where... where human rights defenders often want to assert them. And of course, this is where human rights defenders most often run sharply up against cultural relativists. Can sort of agree and agree to disagree until the human rights defenders come in and saying, look, uh, even though this religion promotes, and this is one of those things that even the words you use shows what side of the issue you're on, right? But even though this religion promotes uh, female genital mutilation slash female circumcision, that's against human rights. They're not allowed to do it. Freedom of religion pff, doesn't doesn't apply here. Okay. So, uh, let me do a quick taxonomy of types of rights. Uh, this is a taxonomy just because taxonomies are neat and you should like them. Um, the other reason, though, is that one of the debates that will happen both in moral and policy circles is that lots of people will accept that there are human rights of one category but not of some others. Um, and the real divide, I guess the, the brightest line, is that there tends to be a divide between people who accept all five of these categories as having human rights of that kind and people who think that there are only human rights of categories one through three. Uh, and rough, very roughly speaking, though not quite, but very roughly speaking, um, the first three categories primarily have negative rights in them, and the second uh, two have uh, primarily positive rights. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a second because there is a little bit of... That's not quite right, but it's almost right. All right, so the first is... Um, you might think that we have human rights that deal with personal rights and liberties. So I list freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, uh, freedom to own property, uh, probably fall into this. These are rights that carve out a sphere of individual freedom uh, against the state, against other people, against your religious traditions, whatever that describe the things that you get to decide for yourself and that nobody can force you to decide otherwise on. Second category is what you might think of as rule of law rights. So these are 
typically kind of procedural. Things like the right to a fair trial, the right to be represented at trial, um, the right to have the laws publicly promulgated so that you know what the heck they are before you violate them, um, the right that the laws should apply equally to everyone, the right against retroactive laws. Um, uh, in the U.S., in the Constitution, we, we, we enshrine a right against bills of attainder, which are basically laws that name a specific person um, as opposed to being of general application. Now, obviously, in detail, a lot of these rights are going to are going to be very much bound to a particular system. So, something like uh, a right to have representation at trial. Uh, you know, that doesn't make any sense if you don't have, for instance, trials or adversarial trials in your system. And there might conceivably be systems that are perfectly acceptable that don't have something like that. So generally speaking, um, what would happen there is defenders of these kinds of rights would ascend to a higher level of, of abstraction. They would say, well, not every system is going to have trials with representatives, but the real right, the more fundamental one, is something like um, if you are going to be punished for something that you get a a chance to defend yourself against the accusation on a fair footing with your accusers, right? And then in a system like the US or Britain or most European countries, this will mean you get a fair trial with representation there. Third, there are political rights. <coughs> and these are, again, in detail going to be somewhat system specific, but an abstract, uh, more universal. These are rights that allow you to participate in the political process. So whereas the personal rights are ones that give you freedom to live your life the, your own way, the political rights are ones that give you the freedom to participate in the communal life in a way that is acceptable to you. So things like freedom of association, freedom to petition the government for uh, with grievances, freedom to criticize the government, uh, certain aspects of free speech fall into this, right? Um, freedom to form organizations and political parties, possibly a right to education. Now, this is why I say that it's not, a lot of these things have been negative rights sounding, but, you know, some of them have a positive aspect. So, a right to education, someone might have to give you education. A right to representation at a trial, someone might have to give you representation. Um, they just tend, these first three categories tend to be, have more negative rights in them than, than positive rights in them. Um, political rights. Anyway, uh, those sorts of things. Now, the first three categories are going to be fairly familiar to any USian students because pretty much the rights enshrined in the US Constitution's Bill of Rights fall mostly into one of these three categories. Okay. Two more categories, though. One is economic and social rights. Um, these would be things like a right to work. Um, a right to a, a different kind of understanding of a right to education might fall here, right? If you think that education is important primarily because of the way it prepares you to participate in the running of the government, that's one thing. But other people might say, no, look, a right to education is just it's just because education is valuable in its own way. Um, other kinds of rights that support your social standing that that allow you to interact with other human beings with dignity uh, might might fall into this kind of category. Right to food would fall in here somewhere. And then finally, um, communal and cultural rights. Now these are a little bit of a, a funny category. The other four categories, at least as I've laid them out, and as the readings sort of roughly go through them, are all individual rights. I have a right to food. I have a right to an education. I have a right to form associations, right? The association doesn't have a right to form associations. I have a right to form associations. There are some folks who think that there are human rights that apply directly to collectives, not just to the individuals in them. So this would be something like um, a culture's right to exist, not just the right of the individual members of the culture to participate in it, um, but the culture's right to exist above and beyond the interest of the individual members. This might seem weird and metaphysical, but there are, of course, policies that can be taken in this way that directly protect the culture rather than the individuals. So, <coughs> pardon me, subsidies for certain kinds of cultural expression might directly protect the culture. They actually change the incentives of the individuals in the name of ensuring that the culture 
continues. Um, so, now, don't take this to be a lot of bright lines. As I mentioned, education might straddle a line, right? It might be both an economic social right and a political right. Might even be also a personal right, right? Um, free speech straddles a line. Free speech, when we're talking about whether or not you can criticize the government, that's a political right. Free speech, when we're talking about whether or not you can, you know, look at pornography, that's a that's a matter of personal right. Um, so there's gonna be lots of things that straddle a lot of these categories, but it's a it's a fairly good I I hope it's a fairly good rough and ready breakdown. And again, it's important because lots of people will accept that there are rights of one or other of these kinds, but not of all of them. And even when you're talking about rights that straddle certain categories, people might want to argue for those rights only in one kind of terms and not another, right? So think about, for instance, Daniel's defense of uh, provision of health. Daniel's, he doesn't talk about it this way, so take that with a grain of salt, but Daniel's specifically does not defend health as what would be a kind of social right. He doesn't defend health just because he thinks that everyone ought to have health because it's good for them and, you know, they ought to have these good things, including health. He defends health basically on grounds that it's a political right, that you need it to participate in the communal life of the society. So, you might want to yourself think about do you think that there's any sort of line? Do you do you buy that there could be political rights, but you don't buy there are communal rights or that sort of thing? And what kinds of arguments could be given to defend one kind of class or another? Because actually, typically, when people are making their lists, when people list what they think are the real are, are the rights, they're listing things that fall into a category. They're not making distinctions. It's much less common to see find distinctions within a category as opposed to arguments about whether or not something falls into the category in the first place. All right. So, um, to, let's take a brief break from the theorizing about the nature of things to point out that, of course, um, human rights are deeply enshrined in international law. Um, if you want to learn more about these many things, uh, you can take my international law class um, or read up on them. Uh, there's probably even more than this. Uh, I won't get into a lot of detail right now about the, sort of the structure of human rights and international law. We can actually talk about it more in class if you're interested. But these are a lot of the most important international uh, treaties uh, on law. <coughs> Pardon me. Starting with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which is actually non-binding. Um, long story, non-binding declaration. Uh, it can be aspirational. That includes a lot of things. And then drilling down through many more legally binding and also more specific uh, treaties through through the years. Um, special shout out to the convention um, oh, what is it? What's the official name? Yeah, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide more commonly known as the Genocide Convention uh, which is the only international treaty I know of that has a Ramones song uh, relevant to it. Um, but one of the things that you should keep in mind about this is that the enshrinement, one thing we're going to return to, is that the enshrinement of human rights in international law raises the question about how and whether these things should be enforced. As you may know, there are issues with the enforcement of international law, but it's a move in that direction. It's a move away from just talking about these things as moral categories and towards the question of should states be bound to do something about them? Should international organizations be bound to do something about them? And in their legal guise, even if uh, we typically don't go in guns blazing to uh, defend human rights, they do issue in sanctions, in money spent on monitoring organizations, and these sorts of policy responses. So, important to keep in mind. Okay, so we've talked about the taxonomy, we've talked about um, the legal structures. So what, what does make something a human right? How do we decide um, what should go in, what parts of the taxonomy we should accept, what should go on our list? There's a few different strategies that people have taken. Um, they're probably not entirely exclusive, but they tend to pull against each other. The first and possibly the oldest is a kind of intuitionist one. And the old phraseology, um, this comes from 
international law discussions of what's sometimes called use cogens, uh, which are these unwritten international laws that are taken to be fundamental to the system and unbreakable, underogable um, laws. Not everyone believes in them, but those who do, the classical formulation of what's on the list of use cogens are things that shock the conscience of mankind. Um, so things that are so intuitively revulsive that any human being of normal decency would shrink from them in horror. Now, I think actually a lot of people, this is what motivates them, right? If you grab a random Amnesty International activist and ask, you know, why is torture on your list of human rights? They're probably going to tell you something of the version of something along the lines of because torture is horrible and horrific. I mean, I it's, I can't imagine doing that to anyone. Um, so you know, don't discount this. Though one of the pitfalls of this, um, well, there are a couple couple ways of thinking about the pitfalls. Um, one of them is that what shocks my conscience, what shocks your conscience, may not be the same. And it doesn't leave us much way for arguing about it. Uh, the other, and the reason why I leave in the, uh, the, the gender-specific classical mankind, is that it highlights that more than just individual variation, what shocks the conscience may be culturally bound, right? What seems disgusting to me and what seems disgusting to you may be largely a function of our upbringing and our culture, and really highlight the way in which human rights may be in danger of not living up to their universality, right? So, um, at least my segment of America talk about homosexuality, eh, you know, doesn't bother me, doesn't bother most people I, that, I, that I hang out with, um, and in fact, it shocks our conscience you know, to think of homosexuals being denied the right to uh, have a romantic relationship or a marriage with whoever they want, right? At least, certainly not all of America, but my subculture of America, that's that's certainly true, right? You go to Ghana, and it shocks most people's conscience to, to think of homosexuality, right? So you get this question about, what is the, what is the shocking human right, right? What is it... Um, you know, is homosexuality so shocking that, of course, there's not a right to it. In fact, there might be a right to not have it around. Or is denying homosexuals their chosen romantic relationships so shocking and disgusting that we have to allow them to, to have them and protect them as a human right? Um, if all you leave it as shocks the conscience of mankind, it highlights the cultural differences without giving you many resources to resolve them. So, a couple more, at least, strategies that, that hold out hope for giving you something more to grab onto for argument is... One is to say that maybe human rights are things that protect against things that have especially bad consequences, right? Genocide gets on the list because the consequences of genocide are millions of people dead. You actually can technically commit genocide without killing anyone. It's hard, but you could do it. We can talk about the details of the convention later if you're really interested in that sort of thing. But typically, millions of people dead. Hundreds of thousands, at least thousands at least of people dead. That's really horrible. That's why you have a human right against against genocide. Um, so one strategy is to say, we just look at the consequences. Some things have such horrific consequences um, that we have to we have to say that you have a right against them. Whatever else might might be going on. A different kind of way, often somewhat compatible but pulling in a slightly different direction, is to say that to really emphasize the human to say that what well, we should consider human rights are things that have a special connection with assaults on human dignity. So, um, human rights against rape and torture are good examples of this. If you're looking purely consequentially, it might seem weird to put, you know, genocide, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people dead, and torture as both falling into this sort of human rights thing, right? Torture is awful, but, you know, it's not... A, it, a, in an intuitive sense, you might want to say, well, it's not as bad as slaughtering people, right? You know, at least they're, they're still alive, even though uh, this, this very bad thing has happened to them. But a lot of folks will want to say, no, no, you're missing the point if you look only at that kind of consequence. Torture 
assaults and debases human dignity in a way that is special. Um, you know, it. One formulation I've seen is that torture essentially it turns your own body into a weapon against you. It breaks something fundamental about being human, which is being able to identify with your body, right? Being able to see your body as a part of you as opposed to an alien, hostile force, right? Um, this, you know, torture inherently relies on degradation and humiliation, not just pain, but breaking of will. Um, turning someone into something less than a human being with a free will. So what makes torture special and deserving of protection as a human right is this connection with human dignity, right? And that's what explains why you have a human right not to be tortured. But most people would think that um, most human right defenders don't think that, for instance, uh, killing in war is necessarily killing combatants in war is necessarily a violation of their human rights even though in some sense being killed is worse than being tortured um, similarly without getting into the gory details similarly for, for, for something like rape the idea is that the, 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 the intent to humiliate someone through violation of their bodily integrity is especially bad and deserves protection with a human right barring that Finally, a very different kind of strategy from looking at sort of the inherent nature of the act, whether it's shocking to the conscience, whether it's an assault on human dignity, this sort of thing, um, is just to say, well, no, 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 we get the universality of human rights, not because they have some direct connection with a fundamental nature of humanity or anything like that, but just because human rights are the things we can all agree on. They're sort of the lowest common denominator, overlapping consensus of what everybody agrees is bad. Right. Everybody agrees genocide is bad. That's why genocide is a human right. Not everyone agrees that gay marriage is good. That's why you don't have a human right to gay marriage. That would be this kind of uh, this kind of picture. Um, now, hold the thought about if you're if you're skeptical of the strategy, we're gonna come back to it. So hold that thought. Okay, as I'm pointed out before, connected to this question of what human rights there are, um, it's important to consider this question in light of what are they for. Because, oddly, especially from a policy perspective, this, this might influence your picture of what should be on the list, right? At the most extreme level, if you're thinking, of, oh, human rights, those are those things we're going to say you can send in armies to conquer people if they don't respect. That's probably going to lead you to say, well, probably only things like ongoing genocide should be on that list. Whereas if we understand that human rights might be used in different kinds of ways, it might open up a different sort of understanding of what should go on the list, right? It, now, of course, if you think that really we should reserve it for the things you send in the army for, that's fine. But just understand that these two questions are linked internally. So one thing is to say, human rights don't do anything. Um, asserting that someone has a human rights is just a human right to something is just a special way of, uh, it's just a fancy way of saying that uh, it would be good if we uh, do or don't do certain things to them. It's just a, a particular kind of moral jargon. It doesn't do anything more or less than morality does. Um, a second kind of way of thinking about this would be that human rights forms a useful common language, especially in the international plane. The acceptance of human rights as a concept allows people from different backgrounds, people from different nations, people from different states, people from different moral understandings to at least agree on some kind of common conversation that they can have about what we ought and ought not be doing to people. This might not sound like a lot, but it is actually pretty helpful, right? If we can have a common understanding, it can bring us together, it can keep us from talking past each other, it can give us some space for actually hashing things out in a way that if we all were using, say, the lingo of our particular divergent religions, might be much more difficult. Um, think of it like a common playing field for working out uh, moral concepts. And it actually, you know, it wouldn't be that human rights represent an existing consensus, but it might be that human rights is a kind of linguistic tool for achieving consensus. It gives us a common way of talking about it in a way that we can resolve our differences. Okay. Escalating a little bit from here, 
you might think that basically what makes a human what's interesting about human rights is that they're a legitimate basis for cross-cultural criticism there are a lot of folks who think that basically it doesn't make sense it's morally and epistemologically illegitimate to critique the norms of another culture right this is a we're going to get to this in a minute but um this is a kind of moral relativism right to say um look a lot of people will want to say if your culture um, decries homosexuality and my culture accepts it, that's not much different from, you know, in your culture it being acceptable to eat dogs and in my culture that being considered disgusting, right? Um, we understand that the whole thing about eating dogs, uh, you know, if you're a vegan, you think both of them are wrong, right? But if you're not, you know, the whole thing about eating, whether or not it's disgusting to eat dogs, that's that's just culturally bound, right? Anyone with any kind of cosmopolitan understanding of the world is going to say, there's no right or wrong about it. It's just the norm of, of, of a particular culture versus another. And a lot of people will say, things about homosexuality, views about women, views about, you know, torture or whatever, these are just um, one culture to another. You can't criticize them if you're outside the culture. But one way that human rights might be used, one thing human rights might be useful for is some people will say, well, except for violations of human rights. If your culture does things that I don't think are good, but they're not violations of human rights, then maybe I should keep my hands off. I have no right to criticize you. But when it becomes a violation of human rights, then it's morally legitimate for me to criticize you. Maybe not do anything more, right? But, you know, criticize you. It can be morally legitimate to, to do that. I mean, you can at least be a jerk. Being a jerk is a moral status. So, um, policy-wise, it might be legitimate to you know make public criticisms of, of this in a way that it wouldn't for other sorts of things. Um, you know, it would be unreasonable for Secretary Clinton to say, "Man, you know, some places in the world they eat dogs. That's horrible and disgusting, right?" That would, she shouldn't do that, right? But it might be legitimate for her to say, "You know, some places in the world they." Um, they don't allow women to go to school, and they, they, they shouldn't do that, right? That might be morally legitimate. Um, ugh, I always get to this part of the slide, and I realize that soft power I, I used here in a way that, that is not, of course, the way that international relations theorists mean it. But the idea is that human rights might be a legitimate basis for using various kinds of sanctions short of uh, military coercive force. Uh, economic sanctions, trade restrictions, um, aid conditionality. So <clears throat> if some nation uh, does not respect the human rights of its people, maybe you don't have a right to invade them, um, but maybe you have a right to say, we're not going to trade with them, and we're going to seek international rules saying that nobody should trade with them until, they, until they, they clean up their act. Or finally, you might think that, yeah, we get to invade them. Human rights violations, or at least some kinds of human rights violations, might provide a legitimate basis for violating sovereignty in the most drastic way possible through a military intervention. Um, you know, either just to stop the abuses um, or to get rid of whatever government or even bring them to, you know, bring them to punishment uh, was responsible for them. So again, what you think human rights are for might affect what you think it's legitimate to put on that list. You might be more forgiving of what goes on the list if you're just thinking of this as a legitimate basis for criticism uh, than if you think of it as a, a justification for sending in troops. You might also think that different kinds of human rights justify different kinds of things. Maybe genocide says you get to send in the troops, whereas uh, denying education to women just gives you a legitimate basis to slap on trade sanctions or something of the sort. All right, here's the big question. Are human rights universal? They claim to be, but does this even make sense? This is quite possibly the um, most common criticism of the whole human rights project as opposed to individual uh, rights that might be on the list. Uh, there's a few ways this has manifested uh, for a while. This seems to have gone out of fashion. Um, well, no, okay, one part of it's gone out of fashion. Um, one of the main criticisms is this leveled against human rights as they're understood in terms of sort of international discourse, human rights NGOs, human rights laws, is that these are basically Western constructs. These are the morality of 
bourgeois, capitalist, affluent, white, Western nations. And they do not reflect the moral understanding of people from cultures outside of that sphere. Um, now, historically, when they put together the Universal Declaration, they did actually try to get people from outside the West. But, you know, they were typically Western educated. So th the criticism that historically it's rooted in Western ideals has some validity, at least in terms of where the laws came from, where the discourse of NGOs and this sort of thing comes from. There's some validity that's rooted in, West, in the West historically. The question is, what does this mean? There are some folks, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, this is the part that doesn't seem to be as current anymore, but Lee Kuan Yew, the former president of Singapore, was a big proponent of what he called the Asian values approach. And you'll hear echoes of this in some discussions of China, um, where the big thing that the Westernness comes in for criticism on often is the supposed individualism of human rights, the idea that these are rights of individuals against the collective. And Lee Kuan Yew and others have, have argued, no, no, no. In Eastern cultures, in Asian cultures, the collective is considered more important than the individual. The family, the, the, the kin group, the nation are considered more important than the individual. So these rights that say, you know, you're allowed to go against your family, you're allowed to go against your tradition, you're allowed to go against your religion, that's all, that all needs to be protected. Um, these are not appropriate for Asian cultures. These are not universal rights that everyone ought to have. They're just rights that individualistic Western societies want people to have. Now, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. This, this is probably a caricature of Asian culture, the same way that saying that, you know, it, if you say Western culture is individualistic, it's much more complicated than that. But this is the kind of debate that happens. And what it all flows from is what's often called descriptive relativism, or I've sometimes heard this called anthropological relativism. And you will sometimes hear it called cultural relativism, or, um, but that can be confusing because cultural relativism can mean other things as well. But descriptive relativism is just the view that, um, is just the, the fact, really, that different cultures, in fact, hold different views about rights. People from different cultures, in fact, disagree about what rights people have. You know, I disagree with lots of people, um, not to blow your mind that your professor is somewhat liberal, but, you know, I believe that homosexual, homosexuals have a right to get married. Uh, obviously, I disagree with lots of people um, from other American subcultures, from other cultures around the world. The question is, what follows from that? What does it matter that we disagree? And really, the, the deep question is, are human rights like scientific statements? Where the fact that people disagree about science doesn't really matter that much. We think there's a fact of the matter about science, regardless of the fact that people disagreed, right? In medieval Europe, they thought that diseases were caused by evil spirits. Nowadays, we think diseases are caused by viruses. We don't care that much about the disagreement. We say, no, medieval Europeans were wrong. Current, you know, science is right. Um, so is morality like that? Is it just a matter that either I'm right and homosexuals have a right to get married, or people who disagree with me are right and they don't have a right to get married? But either way, it's, it's, it's a truth about the universe in some way. Or is morality more like um, aesthetics, right? You can't see, you know, a painting being a good painting is not just a matter of whether people like it, right? It's not just a matter of, it's not just like I like chocolate ice cream, I like vanilla ice cream. But the rules for what's a good painting can certainly be culturally bound or even bound by certain traditions, right? I can see a painting that I don't like, but say, oh, I understand by, you know, by the lights of what the cubists were trying to do. That's a good cubist painting, right? But what a good cubist painting is would be a horrible, you know, representational portrait. Um, so the real deep question is, does the disagreement, like disagreement in science, just show that we don't know everything yet and people disagree about some of the parts that are hard to figure out? Or does the disagreement between cultures about, about what rights people have, is that like disagreement in art? where disagreement in art shows that there are deep 
irreconcilable traditions, no one of which is sort of objectively better than any other. <coughs> if you worry about the disagreement, if you're not willing to just embrace the moral realist side of things and say, I don't care about the disagreement, all the disagreement shows is that some people are wrong. If you don't think that's the way to go, um, one way to go is to say, well, if you want to save human rights at all, right, you might just chuck the concept. But if you want to save it at all, one way to go is to say, well, let's look for a sort of lowest common denominator or an overlapping consensus in the Rawlsian sense. You know, let's find the things that everybody agrees on. Anthropologists sometimes do this, right? You'll hear anthropologists talk about how, well, you know, there's lots of cultural variation about morality, but everybody agrees incest is bad. Um, the problem with this is that you might not end up with much of anything. And it especially matters how universal you want to go with looking for your overlap, right? You might say, genocide. Everyone agrees genocide's bad, right? Well, I don't know. Nazis? Hutu power types in Rwanda in the 90s? Um, the neo-Nazi dude who lives a few streets over from me here in Baltimore? Probably not everybody agrees on this. And if not everybody agrees on genocide, chances are... Um, not every single human being in the world agrees on anything. And then you're left with either having to say, well, it's what all cultures agree on, and then you get into some difficult questions about things like, is Nazism a culture? Um, or you have to say something like, it's all reasonable views, but then you're potentially importing your moral understanding to the question of what's reasonable, right? Um, if I want to say, well, look, the neo-Nazi is not reasonable, so I don't have to care about his views, well, then you, you get into the question, well, why, why don't, you know, basically, why don't I think the neo-Nazi is reasonable? Because he holds horribly immoral views. But then I can't use, I, I have sort of a bootstrapping problem with my morality. Um, so the other way to go is just to embrace the realism. It's just to say, human rights principles are not things that everyone actually accepts. They're just things that everyone should accept. Now, there might still be some room for cultural vari variability in here, and I won't get into this in detail, but you might think that, for instance, there is a sense of what a, say, a reasonable American would believe, and what a reasonable, you know, French person would believe, and what a reasonable uh, Kazakh would believe. And these might not all be the same things, right? Even though what a reasonable Kazakh would believe may not be the same as what all actual Kazakhs believe. But, um, yeah, if you're really interested in going down that road, let's do it in class. Well, obvious next question is, does it matter if human rights are universal? Um, one of the deep questions uh, is really one of kind of paternalism. Uh, you remember going back to the, to the discussion of what kinds of things you can do with human rights. One of the questions that comes up about uh, their universality is the question of, is it wrong to do something based on a principle that was truly right, right? Imagine you're a realist about this. Would it be wrong to take action based on some true human rights principle um, if the people that you're ostensibly helping don't agree with, with you, right? Um, so the paternalism is sharpest when you are doing things for someone's own good that they don't necessarily agree with or even that they don't have a chance to agree with, right? So think of things like promoting democracy through military means. Uh, even if you believe that democracy is good and good for everybody and everybody has a right to it, you might have this question of, um, well, what do we do about people who um, either we didn't check with them and we might not be able to check with them, right? You couldn't poll Afghans very easily in 2001 and ask them if they wanted democracy and how they felt about the U.S. bringing it by force. You probably could do some kind of polling, right? But it would be difficult. Um, now there's deep questions about whether polling is the same as the will of the people. Let's not get into those. Um, you know, can you still, can you give them democracy even if, even if you're not sure that they want it? Uh, certain kinds of issues about women's rights. There are women who buy into what a lot of people see as patriarchal structures, different kinds of oppression female circumcision slash genital mutilation, right? There are women who support the women who do the practice, right? A lot of places where it's done, it is primarily women who perform the operation. Um, can you can you free them despite themselves? Uh, 
is one of the issues that, that, that comes up if you worry about the universality of morality. A different kind of question, and that sort of goes to undermining the whole question about their cultural universality, is the question about whether cultures are fixed. Um, there's a lot of depth to this kind of issue, but the basic thing goes back to just this recognition that, you know, talking about what Americans believe. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's probably nothing that Americans believe. There's certainly nothing that all Americans believe in the sense that, that Americans believe in the sense that every single individual American believes it. There's really no belief that is held by every single individual American. When we talk about what Americans believe, you know, we're talking a little bit more mushy sense about like what's the dominant belief. I mean, there's a sense in which if I say, you know, Americans believe in capitalism, right? Like that's going to strike most people as basically true, even though everybody knows that's not, it's not that every single American believes that capitalism is awesome. Um, or even if I said Americans believe in democracy or Americans believe in freedom, right? There's all going to be not universal. And the other problem is that um, cultures change over time and cultures change with contact. So the cultural relativist picture in its purest form relies on the notion that there are these things, cultures, that we can identify. But if you problematize that and you point out that, you know, when American culture and Ghanaian culture contact each other, they change, they morph, um, people change their views, you get into some really hard questions about well, what does it mean to talk about what Americans believe versus what Ghanaians believe. Um, and this undermines, to some extent, the terms of the debate about whether or not um, human rights morality is universal. Uh, and you can think back to this issue of common jargon, right? Um, it might be that human rights are universal, not in the sense that they're written into the fabric of morality in some abstract sense, not in the sense that they're agreed upon by every culture in the world, but that we are creating a universal human rights culture that every country participates in to some extent, right? Um, like I said, the, the whole Asian values debate seems to be fading to some extent. Uh, China typically does not defend itself on the world stage by saying, we don't care about human rights, or by saying, no, no, we don't understand human rights the same way you do. China typically defends itself on the world stage by arguing in human rights terms, right? Um, even when you get something like uh, arguments about China's defense of Sudan uh, over the Darfur crisis, China typically doesn't say, no, we don't care about human rights. China typically says, no, there's an important human right to self-determination that protects sovereignty, and that's what we don't want to violate. So, maybe cynical, but that's the language they use to defend themselves. Um, and finally, as I pointed out before, universality might matter more for some kinds of uses of rights than others. Um, if I'm wrong about a right being universal and I think that it justifies uh, military intervention, well, you know, I, now, I've, now I've killed some thousands of people uh, in the name of my mistake. Uh, if all I think human rights is about is allowing for cross-cultural critique, well, maybe I was a jerk to somebody I shouldn't have been a jerk to, but that's a much much less bad. I, I'm a jerk all the time. I kill thousands of people very rarely, so it's a much less bad sort of outcome. Okay, bringing it home to the summary, finally. First, the whole concept is that human rights are these things that are somehow fundamental to the very nature of being human. They are obligations that your mere existence as a human being imposes on other people around you. It's both a legal and a moral concept, but keep in mind that it straddles that line, because different issues arise for the legal concept and the moral concept, and it's real dangerous to just slide from one to the other, to say that because it's the law it must be right, or to say that because it's right uh, there must be a law protecting it. It's probably true to a significant extent, not entirely, and there's a lot of debate about this and echoes in other cultures, but realistically it's probably true to a certain extent that human rights as they figure in international law, as they figure in the mission statements of international NGOs, as they figure in the way that they get deployed in international relations, have a historical tie to a Western context. But it's a matter of debate how much that matters. Some people think that, roughly speaking, hey, they're good ideas that happen to have come from the West, 
other people think that, no, these are Western ideas not applicable to other people. And again, it comes down to, really this comes down to the really deep questions about morality that we're not touching in this class. Is morality sort of like science? Is morality sort of like aesthetics? Is morality its own sort of thing? What kind of standing does morality in general have, human rights in particular? And finally, keep in mind that you don't have to give answers to these questions necessarily that apply blanketly to every single thing that anyone has ever claimed as a human right. There are different categories of things, um, and there may be different appropriate policy responses to violations of things that fall into different categories. So, hopefully that's given you something to think on, and I will see you soon.